It's welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show, except there's not much fishing in it. Now, what I'd like to do is to thank those guys who watch, religiously watch, all the weird and wacky working type, lockdown type videos I put up. I really appreciate that, guys. I know some of you people are very interested in them. If you're just interested in totally fishing, I can see you're going to scroll straight along or just go off. I don't have a problem with it, but I do appreciate the guys that watch it and take the trouble to comment. So this one, sit down, relax. It could be a bit of fishing in there. I might have dropped a little bit in. Could be a sneaky one. And there might be some interesting stuff in there for you to watch anyway. In the times of this COVID-19, look, what does it cost you? It's free to watch and it gets you through another 30 or 40 minutes. Well, it's crunch time, people. It is time I investigated to see if my experiment of potatoes in a pot is going to bear any literal fruit. A sort of success, I think, is my attempt to grow a forest with horse chestnut or conkers. They seem to have taken, and I think I'm soon going to have to plant them out. So they look like there's the new shoots coming through, and here they seem okay. I pulled off a few, see this, I don't know, they get, do get this moth disease, I think of, I did read somewhere. See there, something's eating it. So they might want moving for the autumn. I've got a few beans left here, a few beans. I've got to go. They've been blasted by the storm, Storm Ellen, I think it was. So I'm trying to salvage one more meal off of this. It's going to be bits and pieces of whatever's left over. Come here, that one's a bit small, but listen, that's the last one. He's gone soft. Just show you guys. See that yellow in there? That one is, and there is, which I should keep if I want to keep them, the bean for growing next year. I'm going to struggle to get enough of them here. I might get enough for a sample. And that we've eaten so many different beans. The beans have been okay this year, but they've got to be watered. In fact, I probably haven't got enough. Somebody's Somebody's been here, Smith, has he eaten them or what? Does he eat them raw? There's next year's bean inside there. So I can dry those out and hopefully that will save me buying seeds. So I'm normally checking these potatoes out <clears throat> when they're going over like this. Actually when they're falling over, see if anything's going to be underneath there. So I'm going to take them down the end there, just tip them out. I've put in here one potato by the look of it. Let's just have a look, see what... There is more than one here. I can use these pots and soil for something else. Oh my God. <laughs> well, half of one old jacket potato cut in half. Looks like, yes, I've got something there. Look, we know, we always knew it wasn't going to be a big crop because, you know, it's, it's, it's growing. Look, no, tell a lie, tell a lie. A half of one potato, oh my God. Look, oh yes, this was a success, people, which I knew it would be. Get a bigger crop if they were out in the open soil. But listen, they're the beans I'm going to keep for seeds. That one's got sunlight on it. You can see it's gone green at the top. I can cut half of that off. Well, 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 that was an experiment well worth doing, people. So anybody out there is limited on space and you've got pots and soil, Bung a couple of potatoes in there, and that's what comes back. And better still, tomatoes in the pot have worked. Some I've already picked in the kitchen. But these need another bit of a soak up. So what they do is they dry out and then they split. But what they tell me hasn't been a great year for tomatoes. That's what they're telling me. I don't know why. But there we go, people. Well, there we go. I've got some potatoes out of one pot, a few beans, got some tomatoes, and I've got beans which can go in the potting shed here, ready for uh, drying out for next year's crop. An experiment well worth doing. I'm just going to leave these to dry out there naturally, not in the, uh, in the light. I put them in the so the sun doesn't go on them. There's a few cobwebs in here. <laughs> 
Right, let's get in and sort these potatoes out. Well, these three are ripe here. These aren't, but if you put them on the sun or on a bright windowsill, they will ripen there as well. So, I was just coming out to check all this massive growth I've got, the lilies before they die back, deciding whether I'm going to get a shovel, get in there and split them apart, um, because I've got more lilies than I know what to do with. And lo and behold, I see a tuft of something over there. So, what is going on here? I kept my little shrimping net. I'm going on a fishing expedition. Lo and behold, it's bad swimming lessons for Mr Tufty. This pond is saving me a fortune in tutu pellets. Why do they... I don't know what it is. They've got a, they've got a fountain over there that they can uh, get water out of. So I don't... I think that's a big, quite a big one, that one. Is this like the elephant graveyard they say is in Africa, where the elephants go to die? Is this the squirrel graveyard of England? Why do they come and hurl themselves off the cliff edge into my fish pond? I don't know. I've had foxes, mice, squirrels. I've had more squirrels in the pond than I've had with the two too. That will be gone in the morning. I should think Colin the kite, the big crows, carrying crows, or during the night, Mr. Foxy. Better have a look at the other one. There might be customers in here as well. The lilies have gone crazy, but they didn't flower much this year. I've just got them in there loose. It's gone like the Amazon jungle of lilies. It's a massive, massive bed set. I really need to give them to somebody and thin them out a little bit. Anyway, on to the next job, people. It's been so dry that this uh, lavatory is drying out here. It's dying back. Now's the time to take some cuttings, actually getting towards sort of autumn time. And the other one that's done really well was this one, in what we call this little area, Dingley Dell. God, this was an absolute jungle. I had to dig this out manually, it was not great. But this one's done really well. See the leaves much better, it's cooler. It is cooler. The other one's in the sun over there. So when it's in the sun, it's gonna come and flower earlier, but unfortunately it's gonna lose the flowers and then dry out quicker. This one's done much better, and this is probably the one I'm going to take some cuttings off. So you're going to whack it back down here somewhere. You can put some hormone rooting powder on it if you want, uh, and then just basically put them where you want. They either grow or they don't grow. They've got two choices, as my granddad used to say, one and none. I don't know how to tell you people. <laughs> it's really upsetting. It's my one cucumber seed. In fact, I've planted three, I think, in the potting shed. I got what a good plant. It's gone miles. <laughs> it's halfway up the A30 to Salisbury. I think it's going to Stonehenge. But it doesn't seem like there's too many cucumbers on it. I mean, down here, look. What's that? What's 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 <laughs> what's that? Have I overwatered it? Should I not have put it on here? I put it there because I thought, look. That's, that's the biggest one. I've, that's the biggest one I've got. It's all prickly. It's like a bloody cactus. What's that all about? I don't understand. It looks like it's been growing in a Fukushima nuclear reactor or something. So I've got a three-inch. I think it's a cucumber. Maybe it's a disease. Something that resembles something. <laughs> I just don't understand. Look, it's, it's run. Look, there's another one there. Maybe, maybe it should be on the... I didn't want to... Let's put it down here. Maybe it should be... No, the slugs will get it, won't they? I'm not sure whether I'm going to make one-tenth of a sandwich out of that. So really, guys, tomatoes, potatoes, beans, a sort of success. But the cucumber's not good, is it? <laughs> a nice steak kidney pie my own homegrown potatoes and beans oh yeah okay i had to go and buy the carrots so it's welcome to the totally awesome fishing show again folks i'm here in the tackle shack for those who are new to the program program oh, that sounds professional i like the sound of that the program this was built by my fair hand 12 13 years ago as a surf shack for Mike. It was built from empty packing crates. 
entirely by my own hand. Still standing 13 years later. And then it wasn't used, it turned into cobweb land. Some nasty things were crawling around in there. If you look back on our shows, you'll see it. Then Mike said to me, why don't you renovate it? It would make a great tackle shack, which I did. And of course, all the brickwork, the other guys who are regulars, look, you can see this. Mostly used during inclement weather and the winter when it's cold. And I can light this chappy here. The world famous G stove. And I cook in here as well. Anyway, this is a sort of a numb fishing one. It's a bit of everything. But to start off, I'm just going to give you a little teaser. I went on a thresher shark drift with Wayne looking for toothy critters like this. But we never got them. But what we did get was interesting. Fishing, a long flowing trace, a whole mackerel, bumping it just off the bottom because we had some interesting ground on the echo sounder. Wayne looked into a couple of nice fish. So we're now thinking, hey ho, while we are shark drifting, should we be bouncing big baits on the bottom? You never know what's down there, as turned out this day. It's not doing the kicks or head shakes, is no, it? No, not at all. It's a tote, I think. Or... No, it's a bullass. Bullass, yeah. Bullass. Well, well, well. I'm not, even sure he's, I'm not even sure he's hooked. Do you know that? He's just holding the bait. Uh, yeah, look, he was. Yeah, well. it wasn't, yeah. That's out of 130 feet, and he was just holding the bait. The previous not, fish, the previous uh, one. <laughs> just had a bullass there that's come out of 130 feet of water holding onto the bait. It wasn't even hooked. Um, and he only let go of it when I tried to lift him out of the water, but. This is a nice bonus when you're shark fishing. Yeah. You know, you've got to remember to uh, diversify sometimes, and if it's not happening, make something happen. And it's way you on again, bumping a bait along the bottom. Is that a scad? Was that that time, Wayne? No, it was a little, uh, little Joey mackerel. Oh, oh! Benito. <laughs> the, the, the great thing is, you don't know what it is till you see it. I mean, you can guess, which we, you probably know by now. We like to guess what it is on the way up. Say whether if we think it's a bass or a ray or whatever. But genuinely, when you're hopping a bait in over 100 foot of water out here, who really knows what it is until you see it? I'd suggest this isn't a... Uh, Head shaking bass, you, you think? You see it now, it looks like another bass. It is indeed. And there you go. And that's just in the middle of nowhere. In, in what 120 foot of water and that's why it's always worth it when you're fishing for sharks and there's not a lot occurring let's get that line out that's just the shark line one of them and there you go look at that lovely hooks right for the top jaw there and um straight in the frying pan well he's going to go in the frying pan he's a nice good, good eating size i'm going to risk lifting him in because i think he'll be fine and uh I've got one today and there's my second one, so I'm entitled to two as it stands. No sharks, but you've done well on the bash. <laughs> well, yeah. it's not over till it's over with the sharks, but he's a good eating size, so he'll come home to dinner. Right, so folks, a few tips. Might do a bit of gardening, might do a bit of fishing, some jobs around the house, but little tip here. These are my regular fishing reels, okay? I filled them up with new line. First time in two years. That was before the start of our UK fishing season. I don't know. I think it was just after the lockdown. I think it was in June. Went up to the River Wye. Had unbelievable fishing up there. But there was one swim. There was a snag. I had, I had 16, 30... I think I had 35 barbel in four afternoon sessions. Unheard of for me, really good. But a couple of the reels I had, they got dragged across the boulders or a snag or something. I would, I found this honey pot of a shoot, what they call a shoot, and put the film up here, put it up later. Um, and it's funnel all the food down there. So it's a standard sort of procedure. But there was something upstream of it, and because I, I was free line and I had to cast upstream, allow for it to sink before I could bump this luncheon meat down through where the chute where I wanted it to go. And if I hooked a fish, it went up back over here, and I could feel it grating. I think it was a piece of metal, or I don't think it was wood. 
I lost a couple of sets of gear in it. I didn't lose any fishing at all. But it was like the fish was over there, digging down, and say like this table, I'm back over here on the bank, well, just wading. And I think it went up and over, and the last 10 or 20 feet, 15 feet was rubbing over there. So I could feel it. I've taken some off, but it was new line. So what you can do, yes, folks, is to save money, is you can reverse a line. I've put films up on this before, I'm doing it sea fishing where you reverse a line and I get a big uh, drill and a giant spool, put bolts and washers through it, put it in the chuck, spin all the line off, because with a sea wheel I might have half a mile line on. Most of the time, my freshwater fishing, there's nothing pulling any drag off of here that's gonna go like a bonefish. It's not gonna go 100 yards. Most fish go 30 feet if you're lucky when you measure it, if you did, you know. But anyway, I'm gonna reverse this, so the reels, yeah, people always ask me what reels. Now, I'm not plugging the mates. Why should I plug the mates? A 30-year-old, they're probably all out of, but sizes, they talk of sizes. This one's called a GT3000. That's it, that's what he says, GT3000. This one's called a Perfection 3500 MW, aero, double handle, one of the two single handed ones, and this one I'll tell you, this is a 2500. One of the single handles has a very, very shallow spool. It's like a match spool. And I don't like it. I really don't like it. But what I'm going to do, anybody can do this. I know I haven't used the line because the River Y is not 150 yards across, is it? It's just a matter of 10 yards. I don't know how far it is. I haven't paced it. But it's, it's short, so if I'm playing a fish, I'm losing a bit of line. If I go carp fishing, I'm hooking them down there, and they canter off 15 yards if you're lucky, 20 yards sometimes. So underneath of here is good line. Well, what you want to do, I just unclip it, and you want to put, let's say, the top 10 or 15 feet or 20 yards even is worn, or you'll feel it's worn. I can feel even there, I've cut the stuff off, that's still worn. If you strip all this line off, imagine it all comes off like this. So this end here is the worn stuff, or chafed or rubbed, or might be, might be, because I don't want to lose any more fish if I can help it. I want to catch all the fish that I hook. This end say worn, this end's brand new. I'm trying to do, look, that, and then put, one assumes a duff end on there. I don't want to cut loads off, because then the spool here will be narrow, and it'll make it, Difficult casting, not difficult, I won't get the same distance. So I put the old stuff on the bottom, and then the new stuff when I wind it on is near the top. That will last me the rest of the season, I reckon, depending on how many fish I catch. So all you do, open the bait alarm, get yourself a spool, a spare spool. I just tie a slip knot on it, all for beginners. Experts and incredibly rich people just go and buy another spool, a new line. I'm using here, this had a 550 yard spool of six pound test. The diameter is 0, 0 0.010, or was it 0.255 mil? Whatever, it's six pounds. Anyway, winding this off, it takes a while. Now the other thing I can feel here is look, because I lent this to some relatives to fish with, look, look, and they, like beginners do, they wind while the drag's still spinning. No, no, that just puts a huge spin in the line. So I have to keep stroking it out, and this will solve that problem, hopefully. I just let this go on loose through my fingers until I get past the twisted line fades there. Look, watch it twist, watch. Look, can you see that? I hope you folks can see that. For beginners, look, it twists up. Now, if I let pull that hard through my fingers as I'm winding on tight, I'm sliding that kink even further down here. So I just do it very, very loose until I get to what I call the good line at the bottom. I do all these because they're like, if I'm not fishing, there's still something for you guys to watch and beginners go, oh, I never thought of doing that. What's this cost me? Say the spool of the line cost me, and it did, about 15 pounds every two years. Say it cost 15 pounds, well really it's only cost me £7.50 to fill three reels up twice. Now, if I get a bit further down there, I can see it goes smoky. When we do a lot of big game fishing, bone fishing, the line gets dragged across rod rings under pressure. You don't get it in freshwater fish in the UK because we don't get fast running fish. If you get fast running hard fish, 
that you know really do put a load up the rod jack rafales bonefish tarp and all that sort of stuff sailfish then you get what's called smoky line now look i've gone past that's just a regular curl from the spool i've gone past the twisty stuff by just doing it loose yeah so you get a sort of smoky effect now i can, I can almost show this to be honest let me get down a bit more i can show you this because the light's still pretty good that one is one that is smoky. This one, I'm hoping you can see that, I've got to the new line. If I move it around, can you see, look, smoky line, shiny, shiny, glistening, means this has never been through the rod guides, okay? So smoky line is another sign. The line is a bit of wear over it, a bit of friction wear across, over the rod rings. Now I've backed up my reels here with whatever, any old rubbish line because I know there's nothing in England that's going to take me 150 yards. There's nothing swimming around on six pound line anyway. So talk among yourselves till I get down to my knot which is about 150 yards away. And there is the knot just there okay. As you can see there's loads of old line on there which I've backed up you can, what we used to do years ago, you used to get semicircular spool clamps that would go on there as line backers because most people don't need, they're never going to see 350 yards of line. Where, where do they think they're casting, you know? Hawaii? I don't know. And there's nothing big enough in the UK to drag 350 yards of line off, not in fresh water that I've ever hooked in 60 years. So I just back it up. I don't want to fill that up with line that I'm never going to use. Snip it off. So don't forget, this is the good end. Now you need to reverse this by putting it on another spool. Little knot here. Oh yeah, I'm gonna mention that because that was something I got on a spool here. I just happened to put, get this spool out. I mean, people probably are pushing stuff go, oh, I just happen to have the XYZ type of spool with me. No, I don't do that, you know that. But this one, this is a braid I use, which is, I want to call it a thick braid, but it's years old. It's called GR500S. So I guess it's S for sinking. Specialist sinking carp braid. 22 pounds. Not strength, it says. It's a 200 meter spool. I've used this for years. And I use it for making catfish hook links. And I use it for, not carp braid, sea fishing. And that's really, really good hard wearing line. That's all I can say. I'm not saying to mate, but you'll have to, guys will find out if you want it, but I don't even know, they still make it. So it's GR500S. Right, so I've got my slip knot. Slip knot goes over the spool. He says, hopefully. Okay. Now, I'm putting on here, if you like, the good end because that's what's going to come off last and will then be on the top of the reel. Now you can put this on something in a vise like this, so it, it spins off. I can actually do it with some, a piece of wood to show you. Uh, just a bit of weight, let's do that. Now you can jury rig something like this, or you can put a pencil through there, get the wife to hold it, and just reverse this all the way. That will probably just friction. If I come down here, oh, I'm going to going to turn into a disaster this because it's not not quite long enough but just trying to give you an illustration look I can work away and I can reverse this spool and get back to you when I've done it in three days time it's time consuming as I say you can put you can rig these up with a bolt through there these spare ones and then put it in a drill and spin it off but with six pound line if the drill gets too fast and you come up against something that stops the line coming off it snaps and then you will have to go and buy a new line. So for the sake of five or ten minutes, you can watch TV, do what you want. I'll just do it like this. Right, reach the end of the spool. Snip off. This is the worn end, don't forget. I get my spool. And I join the two together, you use whatever knot you fancy. We got actually a whole film, I think we got two how to tie fishing knots up, have a look at them, uh, giving all the basic knots. I suppose if you said what's your favorite, I probably, I use the Albright Special Knot, it's called Albright Special 
it's in there, it's in there. It might be, I don't know if it's in Time Fishing Knots 1 or Time Fishing Knots 2. Anyway, I find I use that all the time, pretty well for everything. Bear with me while I tie this on. And I have met Jimmy Albright in the Florida Keys in Bub Mary's Marina, sat and talked with Jimmy Albright, who invented the Albright knot, a proper legend of a serious fisherman. Okay, make sure that you've got your line under the bail line the right way. Look, you can take the spool off if you don't, open that, put the spool back on, close the bail arm, okay? But what I do is I take the, the spool off and I do this. It's just my way of doing it. I don't know if some super duper expert out there says, oh, don't do it that way, mate. I've been doing it for 60 years this way and I seem to do okay. I'm gonna put this knot, I'm gonna go up and down, but I'm gonna put the knot there, right? Right in the bottom of the spool out the way. Because if I put it up here, and eventually I do get down on uh, you know line capacity, when I go to cast, sometimes it will snag or not, and I don't want that. So I do this beach fish, it's more of a sea fisherman's one. I'm sure there might be other fixable sea anglers that do this. Maybe the carp anglers don't do it, but you know, it might be worth thinking about, guys. I put the knot or the join, what we call topping, this is topping, on the bottom there, and I do the first two or three turns. If you did a load of turns, you will throw out the oscillation on the spool and you'll be too high here and too shallow there. So don't do too many, just do a few like this. Open the bail arm, like it's closed, like that. Open the bail arm, pop the spool on, close the bail arm, and now I'm ready to re-spool. Same principle, get your partner, wife, friend, whatever, anything, it can, can, can put a pencil through there, keep a little bit of uh, tension on it, with big game fishing, we put it on high, high pressure. Somebody will be pushing on it, high pressure, wind it on the spool, and it goes on wet. You know, don't need to do that for our freshwater fish. So, going to spool back up here. We used to use something like a book. I can't be bothered to go and get a book. We could use, in this case, if you imagine the book, open the book and then close it with a bit of weight. That gives you, watch, enough tension that it winds it on tight. Just nice and smooth, and then you fill the spool up. So you can get somebody else to do this if you want. You don't necessarily have to have a beer mat and a lump of log. Obviously, a book is ideal. That's probably a little bit too heavy there. There you are, that's better. Now we're away. Now we're cooking on gas. And as you can see, I just fill the reel up. I'll get back to you when it's full. Okay, boys. That's loaded. I don't know if you're going to see this or not. Let me do this. Tidy this up. Pop these off. Tidy that up. Now look there, hopefully in this sunshine, can you see the smokiness on that spool there? Hopefully you can see that smoky. That's an unchanged one. And that's the changed one with new line right on the top. So I've probably got, say, 150 yards, which I would normally put on there. Maybe I've lost five yards, six, seven, eight, ten yards, where I've been cutting back, cutting back. And as worn, I've probably got 130 yards left on there, easily. It's shiny, this is matte. That's been dragged over the rod rings, over the rod guides many times. I've been had a lot of fishes, carp, barbel, chub, and stuff like that. And this one now is the unused, it's unused. It was buried underneath. As you can see, I've turned it round. I'm now fishing with brand new line here. I'm gonna get this done. Oh, before I, before I start on the others. Oh, that, that sun is streaming through now. I hope it's gonna be good for the week. Um, I go into a tackle shop. I don't know, it was Yately. Massive spender, a grain pull of massive spender. Please, clear the counters. I want a tub of BB shot, a tub of treble A shot, and a tub of the big boys, SSGs. Three, and yes, I'll pay for them all in one go. Cater £4.50, it's cheaper than anywhere else I go. I thought I'm not going too local, I'd sooner drive there and get it. 
One of them in there is a gentleman who goes there, oh, I know who you are. I thought, well, strange. <laughs> yeah, he was uh, landing there. Now, I think his name was, he wants a shout out. He's a fan, he's an awesome army supporter. Now, that's one shout out I've got to give you. I think, I think his name was Nat. I hope it was. So the man with the landing net, shout out the Totally Awesome Fishy Show. Thanks for being a supporter and watching all our shows. Nat, <clears throat> I think it might not be. It could be one of these other two people. So for me, I drive in to get some more lunch and meat for more barbel fishing. Go into the yellow and green supermarket. I said to my father, I'm starving. Oh, you gotta wait till you get home. I said, no, let's push the boat out. We're going upstairs and we're going to have something to eat. <laughs> and I'm paying. Oh, oh, she goes. Up we go, sit down, order it, served. Lash out, a sausage sandwich, a bacon sandwich on brown bread, a latte farte, whatever those fancy coffees are for the wife, and a cup of rosy lee for me. Yes, I can pay with it with my beeping machine. Beep. <laughs> I looked at the bill, it was three pounds. So I looked at the wife and said, we'll get our table straight away. Because what it was, was the government lockdown discount thingy. So brilliant, nice cheap meal. But then the young waitress came, came over to me and goes, you're that guy from the Totally Awesome Fishing Show, etc., etc." She might be Nat, I don't know. So like, I've got it all written down there. She wrote it on, down there. <laughs> Can she have a shout out? Because her and her partner watch all our fishing shows, yes. So there is a Jess Woodcock, a Ryan Horwood, and a Nat. I think Ryan is a tree surgeon, but shout out to you guys. I'm gonna go spool filling. I don't normally do shout outs because it would go on forever. But listen, a very pleasant young lady served us and I said I'd give her a shout out. Hopefully she's still working in that supermarket. Hopefully she serves us again because three pounds for a bacon sandwich, a sausage sandwich, a latte farty coffee, and a cup of tea, and two cans of ketchup. Can't be bad, can it? One reel down, two more to go, guys. There we go. Three reels, totally spooled up. Reverse a line, save yourself some money, don't lose any fish. I'm gonna pop in the garden, do a little bit now. You guys might wanna follow me, but first, a little light refreshment for me as obviously I won't be working in the dark, but it is a cracking night out there. A beautiful evening. I shouldn't be doing this in here. I should, I should be out fishing. I should be out fishing. This is all wrong. Goodness me. Let's get in the garden and see what's happening out there. And another thing, what is it with the trees? There's definitely something wrong with the British trees. I've got this one here, and it's like the one I showed you. It's all peeling. Now that's peeled more, I did do a film and it's peeled even more than I showed last time. But the strange thing is, look, it's just peeling off the bark. I don't know, is it going to die? Is it dead? Look at it here. Split absolutely the bark here, that's where it's starting. So it's starting there with just a bit of peeling back. Then it gets bigger there. And here it's just gone back, look, to white wood. But then I've already had one bough off here ages ago. This one, well, where's this come from? This wasn't here the other day. I don't understand why it's come down because I'd be walking through to it on the way to the log store and around the back here. And it's, it's like dead and it's covered in like lichen or moss. So I'm not sure, does anybody, I don't even know what this one is, an alder? Let me show you the leaf. Who knows what this one is? Ash, alder, what do you think that one is? That, that leaf there, guys. Is this, is this a sign? And it's very, very sparse at the top. Is it 5G, which other people say? Okay, I don't know what's happening to all the trees here. And the one at the back that's leaning down over there, I think I showed that one with the uh, rotting out on it. Listen, if you think that one's bad, that's nothing. There's absolutely monstrous oak tree, the biggest piece of fallen off it. It's hollow inside, it's down on the river walk. I've got to walk down there again, it's about a mile. I'm going to show you and film it because I've never seen an oak tree this big. So look, I'm coming up here and even here is peeling away. So I figure I'm going to lose the whole tree. We haven't had this in the 12, 13 years we've been here. And look at these, all these wood lice there. 
Are they what's causing it? My God. It's like an infestation. Look at it. Wowee. Is that, I wonder if I painted that with some, a bit of diesel or something like that. Would that stop them doing it? Or is it rotting and dying and that's why they're getting in there because they want the rotten wood? See it's green there. Just trying to pull this out of it for you. There, it's full of them. Wow, it'd be nice down the jumper. Anyway, over here I can saw it. Maybe I saw it the other direction. On we go. Is this where the saying comes out, cutting out the dead wood? Is that where the saying comes from? There we go. Probably do two cuts here. One there first, I figure. That wasn't in the plan. Something to hang on to. I mean, I'm tempted to cut it right back here. It's a good lady wave, she's got the weed killer. I don't know if to cut it right back or not. I might leave this and then, because it's got all this lichen over it here. Just there, just run that line. You can see it there. I'm gonna leave that, see what you guys come back with. I'm gonna leave that arm out there in case it reshoots, but I've done this a few years ago and this one hasn't. So I'll wait and see what you tree experts come back with on the ideas. That looks like just straight dead wood there. Well, I know it's not a leaf on it. So some of you might have remembered this is what we call the river walk. I did it in the lockdown when we were uh, allowed out for our one or two hours or whatever it was, that, that walk. And it is along the river. Not a fishing river, not for me anyway. We split apart, split asunder that I've ever seen in my life. It is impressive to say the least. But more important, I want to show you what the inside of it looks like because I have never seen anything like this one before. Really nice bit of countryside. Just before the autumn. You can see all this undergrowth, look, this sort of ivy stuff that's everywhere. Now they've had one down before and sawn through it. Fine, it's okay, trees do fall over. But there's one up here that is barely passable. It's truly impressive. And the thing is, they all fall away from the river, but this one's gone partly in it. So it's going to block up and eventually back up and flood here. This area does actually flood. Um, in the winter sometimes we've had trouble getting through and walk. There's the top end of it. It must be a hundred foot high. Right there. See the dead leaves up here, caught up in there. Right, that's the top of it. That is the top of it. So I'm figuring it's at 100 foot high. You can see it up there. It's come away from the base. If I can get through here. Let's just climb through. It is impressive, is it not? Can you imagine walking along this path when that went? You are one dead puppy for sure. So are these any signs, people with tree experts? That whiteness, this has come down and splintered. Be a bit careful, it's right over my head. I'm gonna try and work my way. It's all gone in the river here and taken other trees down. The leaves don't look like oaks, tell a lie. What is that tree? Just look at this, people. From there, all the way out here, how thick and fat is that? I'm gonna put my camera bag around my neck because I'm obviously going on a little excursion. Can you see that? How it split apart? So if it's not an oak tree, what on earth is it? It's immense. Is it an elm? And oh, this is Dutch elm disease. We used to call these lime trees. 
I'm hoping it's done all the falling it's going to do. Climbing, climbing, climbing. Obviously stupidly dangerous ground, but whatever. Look at that. Well, look at this one, a piece of branch. That's a piece of branch. I hope that one doesn't come crashing down on me. It's got to be done, folks. Got a rock here, haven't I? Look. It's rotten. That down in there is just hollow. I don't understand that. It's absolutely a massive rotted out. Look, down here. It's like powder. So tree people tell me what would do that. An impressive creature of its time, hundreds of years old, no doubt, hundreds, and now partly demised. That gives you an idea of the scale of it. If I could turn around without falling all the way down there. Whoa, it's a bit spooky, I have to say. I'm calling this, is it Dutch elm disease, people? Experts tell me, at least, maybe more than 100 feet high. Let's have a look from the bottom end. Be careful not to fall away. Don't want to skid. Well, as kids we would love to play on this. Well, let's face it, I am here, aren't I? So there's the leaf in close up, people. Is that an elm or lime? And if so, would that be the dreaded Dutch elm disease? This is just hopefully being held up by this one piece. A massive, just so guys know there, bracket fungus. But just look at it. The effect when this came out and came down but it's totally hollow. Can you see in there, guys? It is spooky as hell. But I really would love to get in there and poke around. Fancy the ultimate overnight bushcraft survival in there. In a dead tree. <clears throat> 150 feet high. Just blasted apart. I thought it was worth showing you people anyway. So what's happening to all our trees? not just the ones in my garden. Right, let's get back for a cup of Rosie Lee. I know it's not fishing, but a lot of you guys are interested in stuff like this, so I've walked a mile or so back to get your film of it. Guys, we've been doing all this talk about trees, and now I've got the professional. I've got uh, Ryan, the tree surgeon, who is far too high for my liking up there. <laughs> he is way up there. Now, this one, if you remember, I was talking about the slope on it, the lean when we first bought the property. It was sloping look quite a slope on it we figure that branch up there's quite quite a bit of dead stuff on it is pulling it that way so if it's pulling it down it's going to go over eventually as Ryan was saying if it wasn't for all these trees up here then um, it probably would have been blown down because we're wide wide open for the wind here now I can see what Ryan's doing there he's gone right up to the top and he's He's clipped himself to harness up there, rather than me, and he's lowering himself down. Whereas I suppose me, who was trying to get up the top of the ladder there, it's a long way down, isn't it, guys? It's a long way down. For me, anyway, at my age. I see, he looks like he's 
strapping herself to the main trunk as well. For those with sensitive hearing, I think it's going to get noisy. Take a few paces back, just in case. He's obviously not scared of heights, is he? Oh, he is. Is he really? Yeah. He didn't even saw my ladder in half. <laughs> You're saying that uh, you'd use different cuts here. So yeah, if you wanted a, a piece of wood to, to fall off and not swing underneath and whack your ladder, you can do what's called a, a snap cut or a step cut. So if you cut top and bottom um, and overlap the cuts, oh, then see. you're left with a piece of material in the middle, which, which doesn't break off, yeah. um, but then you can, can grab hold of it. 
yeah. and snap it off yourself and then man. Oh, I'm sure you do down. that, yes, you pull it down. Um, and that just makes it a lot more safer. Uh, it saves uh, that splintering business, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it saves all the, the tearing and so on and yeah. so forth and, and just saves it whacking your ladder out from under you. Yeah, that's um, the one yeah. I'm worried about, yeah. To be yeah. smashing down on you. Oh, but, brilliant. Yeah, so, good yeah. man. Yeah, that was quite impressive, but, yeah. Yeah, just a, just a simple way of... And that, and that wood, uh, it's a hard wood? Yeah, eucalyptus is a very, very hard wood. Um, yeah, it's got a, quite a twisty grain in it, so... Yeah. Um, Lifespan of these trees, just out of interest? Um, hard to tell, really. They, yeah. they live, some of the ones in sort of Australia, and that will go quite a long time. Um, yeah. But the ones in the UK don't, don't tend to live for... A huge, huge, because yeah. they tend to fall over. Because it's what's happening there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. No, no worries. Does anybody out there wants a tree cut down? Or oh, Angie Man. Well, guys, appreciate you watching that one. Thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Hit the subscribe button on both channels. We'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>